This conference will now be recorded. So welcome everybody to the ACRM uh, Pandemic Web Task Force webinar series on uh, Thursday, March 26th. Um, thank you for taking time out of your day. I know that everybody has a lot of things going on. Um, for those of you that are new to the series, we're focusing on um, how to how to deal with the the pandemic, the COVID-19, uh, with primarily the center of attention being on treating patients remotely. Um, what's going on in the world with telehealth? What are e-visits? Um, how where do our clinicians need to be? What tools are out there for us to use? Um, and you know how does it vary by care setting? Uh, today we have Carrie Nixon, who's the co-founder and managing partner of the Nixon Law Group and the CEO of Nixon Health Nexus, uh, healthcare reform and innovation consultancy. She also serves as special advisor to Impactful Capital, a healthcare venture capital firm based in Silicon Valley. Carrie's an expert in healthcare law and policy issues relating to healthcare innovation, including remote patient monitoring, telehealth, mHealth, applicant apps, healthcare predictive analytics, personalized medicine, and value-based delivery reimbursement models such as ACOs and other APMs. She provides counseling and healthcare regulatory compliance matters and strategy advice regarding business models and healthcare transactions. Uh, Carrie Nixon, welcome. Can you hear me, Carrie? Thank you so much. I just unmuted. It's good to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I understand that the crowd that is on this call is very interested in knowing how they can best utilize telehealth and virtual communications technologies and remote patient monitoring technologies, um, not only to combat the COVID-19 crisis that we are now facing. All right, my dear, I gotta go. Uh, but also in general, do we have everyone unmuted? Okay. Um, those of you that are on the call, if you can mute your sessions, we're just getting some feedback. Thank you. I think there's probably a way for the, the person who initiated the meeting to, to mute everyone. Yes, I am going through every um, one of the people who've attended and placing them all on mute. What we heard during our previous conversation, uh, a brief introduction to our marketing audience. Great, thanks, you thanks, Terry. Sorry, right, Carrie, go ahead. Okay. I think we've got some more on there that maybe needs to be muted. Um, so there looks like there's another line that needs to be muted. It's giving a lot of feedback. Can you all see that? Thank you, that's helpful. Okay, so um, so this is Carrie Nixon. I'm delighted to be here. I understand that the folks um, on the call here are very interested in, in you know, knowing how to use uh, telehealth and remote patient monitoring, both in response to the COVID-19 crisis and sort of going forward. I am going to ask your, um, your sort of uh, your leniency and your forgiveness in um, walking through this presentation this morning. We have had things change. We have had things change literally um, during the course of this morning. Are you all hearing additional feedback? Yep, I think we got her. We, we have, I think there's several points until they get muted. Yeah, caller 12 is not muted. Okay, so, um, so bear with me as I, um, as I uh, go through this presentation. We've had changes as of this morning in light of the, uh, the Senate bill, the next Senate COVID bill that just passed and, um, will be signed into law. Um, there are changes that I think you all may find very, very interesting. So some of the things that are in this presentation um, as I was putting it together have uh, literally changed um, in the course of sort of the last 15 minutes. So bear with me, I will do my yeah. best to explain. Go off to share my screen. So, 
uh, I want to first focus on um, on telehealth versus remote patient monitoring and, and other virtual uh, communications. So, okay, perfect, John. Thanks. So, it's important to understand that at the advent of telehealth, there used to be it used to be that there were lots of different things that were sort of placed in the telehealth bucket. More recently, CMS, for purposes of reimbursement, have really carved out things like remote patient monitoring and other uh, virtual communications technologies for purposes of reimbursement. And that is for the reasons sort of that you see before you now on this screen. So as many of you on the line know, Medicare reimbursement for telehealth services under normal circumstances has been very, very limited, where um, an individual must be in a designated rural or geographically underserved area and the telehealth service must take place at an originating site. So that's extremely restrictive. Um, um, you know, it is the case under the current um, law that has been passed, that was passed, the Corona Preparedness Law that was passed uh, about two weeks ago, that some of those restrictions have been opened up a bit, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But under normal circumstances, uh, telehealth under Medicare is, is very, very limited. Reimbursement for remote patient monitoring and other forms of virtual communications, however, are not considered telehealth, and therefore they do not have these restrictions. So you don't, you know, an individual uh, receiving remote patient monitoring services does not have to be located in a rural or underserved area, um, nor do they have to go to an originating site. Uh, remote patient monitoring services and virtual communications services are, by definition, not ever going to be face-to-face, -face, right? So telehealth services are really considered an in-office visit that, that would be um, just done virtually. Remote patient monitoring and other virtual communication services are inherently not face-to-face. -face. There was never any reimbursement for them in office, and so the restrictions around Medicare do not apply. So that's good news for you all. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, the COVID Preparedness Act was passed about two weeks ago and created some important changes to Medicare telehealth during the national emergency. So the legislation allowed the secretary and the head of CMS to waive some of these um, geographic um, and originating site restrictions. So under the COVID preparedness bill that passed, there are no geographic or originating site restrictions. There is no pre-existing practitioner or patient relationship required. So this means that even a um, practitioner, a physician or a nurse practitioner um, or a therapist who has never seen a patient before can actually um, engage in telehealth services. And that, that's a big deal. Um, under the new changes, providers can opt to waive a patient's Medicare Part B copay that they would typically be required to pay. The OIG has also weighed in and said that they will not be penalizing any healthcare providers for using a, pl a platform for telehealth that doesn't meet HIPAA requirements. So for example, in this dire situation, providers can even use FaceTime or Skype or Facebook video chat to conduct a telehealth visit to folks on, on the other end, to their patients on the other end. And they don't have to have a business associate agreement in place between them as the healthcare practitioner and you know, FaceTime or Skype, for example. Um, and then finally, licensed providers can provide care outside of the state in which they're enrolled in Medicare, although you have to be careful because the state licensure rules apply. So it used to, it, it is typically the case that in order to provide, you know, a telehealth visit in a state, you have to be licensed in that state and enrolled in Medicare under that state. But uh, Medicare is now saying that you don't have to be enrolled in the state if you, if the licensing restrictions across the various states are uh, are lifted, which many of them are right now, uh, it is fine to provide telehealth services under Medicare uh, across state lines. Next slide. Okay, so here are some of the things that may change. Um, I mentioned to you that, um, you know, we just had the next huge um, COVID emergency bill 
passed through Congress to be signed into law um, immediately. Many of you, I'm sure, are um, aware of the enormous stimulus money that will be provided in that package, but there are also some very important, require, uh, important changes with respect to Medicare. So um, I mentioned to you that under the Corona Preparedness Act, waiver authority was extended for the secretary to change a lot of the, um, to make changes to the Medicare requirements for telehealth. Under this current act, it was just pa passed, those way, that waiver authority is actually extended more. And arguably, it is extended to the point where CMS may choose to waive all requirements of Section 1834M, which govern telehealth under Medicare. So if indeed the secretary and the head of CMS choose to interpret the language in the law that passed today uh, in a way that is most favorable for expansion of Medicare telehealth services, that means that we have a basically clean slate when it comes to telehealth services reimbursable under Medicare. So this first bullet that you're seeing in front of you, um, it's possible that this may no longer be the case, right? So even under the COVID, the COVID Preparedness Act that was passed, telehealth services for Medicare we're still going to have to be the telehealth services that were listed um, as allowable telehealth codes for Medicare. And I have provided, I had provided in the slide the link to that list of codes. I think we've got a little, a few more people who've, who've weighed in who need to be muted. Um, if we can do that, that would be great. Um, so I was speaking to, to John yesterday in preparation for this webinar, and he and I were discussing how many of the codes that are on this list do not apply to uh, rehabilitation <laughs> therapists, right? So um, there aren't a lot of codes on this list that apply to physical therapists or speech therapists or occupational therapists or respiratory therapists. And that is, was obviously problematic. If indeed the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the Administrator of CMS choose to interpret today's act uh, as completely uh, basically waiving or eliminating sec Section 1834M that governs telehealth under Medicare, then they could possibly expand those codes greatly, right? So they could potentially make it such that any, any visit that can be done in office. If it, if it is deemed that it can be done virtually, it could be reimbursed. Um, the second really important change is that if indeed they choose to use, sort of extend this full authority and interpret the, the new law um, in, as allowing them to do so, you will notice that on this list of um, eligible providers typically allowed um, to bill Medicare telehealth visits, you don't see um, therapists. You don't see physical therapists, OTs, STs, respiratory therapists. Um, you know, that may change. Um, it is very possible that, that you know, again, uh, the practitioners and the providers that are eligible to bill these services um, may be opened up. So. As a general matter, I would urge all of you um, quickly and strongly to work with your various associations um, to talk with CMS um, urgently and to uh, encourage them to open up reimbursement um, for a whole variety of codes rather than simply the list that's, that's provided in this link and also to urge them to open up um, the eligible providers to include therapists. Um, I'm sure many of you all will have questions about that and we can talk about it uh, a little bit later on um, when we get to some questions and answers, but I believe that is sort of the bottom line. I think it's potentially very, very good news, but um, it is, 
a bit of a question mark in my mind as to how far CMS will be willing to sort of take the interpretation of um, the law that was set out, and we need to encourage them to read it very, very broadly. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so we just talked about telehealth and Medicare. Um, certainly telehealth services um, are available in a num number of other settings and situations as well. Um, in, the, in the case in the Medicaid context, you'll see that all 50 states reimburse for some telehealth services that are provided by a live audio video platform. And it's sort of a state by state determination as to which states um, reimburse which types of services. And then in terms of commercial payers, you know, as a general matter, we had seen um, a number, a, a lot of the commercial payers be open to telehealth visits and be reimbursing for telehealth visits in a much more broad sense than Medicare was doing. So that's great news. Uh, even better news is that the commercial payers have expanded their um, willingness to uh, to reimburse for telehealth services even more broadly under this crisis. So, you know, many are waiving the copays, they're waiving deductible requirements, um, they may be reimbursing for telehealth visits at the same rate as in-office visits would be reimbursable. And that's called parity. So there are a number of states, I think it's like 36 right now, that have parity laws in place requiring the same reimbursement as for an in-person visit, or they actually have parity laws that say, um, you know, if a service can be provided in office, it has to be able to be provided virtually as well. Some of them don't necessarily tie the reimbursement uh, to the in-person visit. But again, this is sort of a state-by-state -state determination. Um, in states like Virginia, for example, where I am usually located, uh, Virginia has a parity law that does require its commercial payers to reimburse uh, for telehealth visits uh, this in the same amount as in-person visits. So, you know, happy to help um, help you all with, you know, walk through any of those um, determinations um, if that's useful down the road. Okay, next slide, please. Carrie, I just want to make sure that, um, so th this is really big news. Um, yes. I don't want to throw you <laughs> off your, your rhythm because, um, I mean, as you mentioned, you and I, I mean, we just were talking about this yesterday. Yeah. Um, so, basically, I want to make sure I'm understanding this. So the lens that we're looking through now because before whenever we were looking at telehealth services or telehealth you know codes or eligible Friday I mean it was just kind of like you know looking through a shop window where mm -hmm. it's like okay well other people can enjoy this but we're we're on the outside mm -hmm. so what you're saying is with the bill that came out today there is a strong possibility that PT OT SLP cardiac rehab like they're going to be included in this so what we're seeing the things that were were applicable to telehealth now are applicable to this group but that and your previous slide and, and what we had looked at yesterday that that link that was on the previous slide and we'll make this available after carrie right is that are you you're okay with us posting yeah, this right. out mm -hmm. um the, is the link is a, there's an excel file and it lists out all the cpt codes with the descriptions and they're really they're for the list of providers that were on that previous page so they're not really applicable for the ancillary services mm -hmm. uh, and so I think what you were saying is that now we have to figure out what codes are going to be you know if we open it and we take off the restriction we're now allowing our listeners and viewers to participate we have to figure out what codes are then going to be so there's more work to do is what you're you know that's I think that's what you're emphasizing and I may just be slow to the party, but you know, you're that's where you're saying, you know, we need to reach out, we need to be working with ABTA, ASHA, and AOTA, um, who they're gonna be coming on in the next few days. Um, so we can maybe, you know, maybe they'll have information respective to those individuals, uh, groups. Um, but I just want to make sure so what you're seeing on the screen now, these are the things that we're now gonna be faced with and are are applicable to us. So those of you that are, you know, are, are working with Medicaid you know, and are looking at, you know, reallocating staff, especially in ambulatory, if you're, you know, trying to turn them into uh, remote telehealth providers, this is going to be really important. And the, the commercial payers, those, um, we have a link link out 
um, uh, the Southeastern Telehealth Resource Group, um, they have a really nice page where it's broken down state by state um, and lists out exactly what's allowed and what's required um, at the state level. So, sorry, Carrie, I wouldn't throw you off. I just wanted to kind of make sure that we were cut up or um, not cut, just caught up in, in, in what you were saying and sort of not legalese, but it just it's really technical and I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something. Yeah, it's it's a little crazy, right? I mean, this you know, I did not have the um, opportunity, unfortunately, to sort of um, tailor to retailer the slides to you know what happened today um, or this morning. And um, you know, I was on the phone you know half an hour ago with the um, American Telemedicine Association's you know national policy person, um, kind of running through piecing and cross-referencing these three pieces of legislation together to cobble together you know where we stand right now mm -hmm. and it is our feeling at this particular moment <laughs> that uh the legislation that was passed this morning mm -hmm. does provide the opportunity for cms to open up telemedicine for medicare reimbursement to more eligible providers than typically were the case that were listed and to more telehealth services that were typically listed. It allows CMS to do that. It does not require them to do that. So what I am saying in terms of work to be done is that it will be critically important right now for your um, advocacy organizations and for you potentially, you know, as, um, uh, representative of, of representatives of health systems and large practices to reach out to CMS and to let them know um, the types of things that you as therapists are able to do via virtual visits that you need to be able to do um, mm -hmm. especially during mm -hmm. this time. Okay that's great sorry I, I all right I, I, absolutely I, I'm, I'm I, I think we're, we're caught up with you now. Can well, I ask right. a quick question? Sure. Can you give us um, kind of like a phone number? Like, what's the best way to reach out to CMS to kind of push, try to get this push forward? Yeah, I mean, I would, so, so I would ask your advocacy organizations for sort of their point of contact um, within CMS. There are, you know, well, I will just say, as you can well imagine, C the staff at CMS are being hit from every direction right now. Um, um, in terms of getting like to the right person that has the authority, you know, that has authority to sort of make this stuff, the stuff happen, I would, um, you know, potentially recommend um, Deputy Administrator um, Demetrius uh, Kazukas, and you know, you can look at the the um, the CMS staff directory for his information. Yeah, and, and, then, and we have, and, and the ACRM has, we have some a list of contacts also that we yeah. can we can post. So we'll we'll be we'll be having we'll have time at the end for some for some Q and A. I want to, I feel like I already kind of sidetracked you, and we we have a bit more to get through. Yeah. Um, so let's hold the questions Good. until we after the presentation, and maybe some of that will be more clear. And and then we also have resources that we're urging. Uh, people to uh, to call out and with CMS also and then you know with your member organization so APTA, ASHA, AOTA um, they're also a good way to, to funnel and channel some of that so sorry Kurt go ahead okay yeah no so um next slide okay so now let's turn away from telehealth for a moment and turn to remote patient monitoring which you know there is a there's a pretty good um, argument to be made that this is an area where um, you all can really uh, have an impact. So um, this is sort of my own definition of remote patient monitoring as, you know, called from the Medicare physician fee schedule and various um, sort of uh, stakeholder organizations. It's really the collection of patient generated health data by a patient or a caregiver that's outside of a traditional clinical setting, so for a home or elsewhere, for example, that is dig digitally stored and transmitted to a physician or other qualified health care professional for interpretation and, as necessary, intervention. Let's go on. Okay, there are a number of use cases for remote patient monitoring. Uh, a very typical one is ma managing patients with chronic disease. That's kind of the first one that everyone thinks of. 
Um, but, um, but you know, there are a number of other use cases as well, including very relevant to you all, post-discharge care, right? So, um, so someone uh, post-surgery, someone undergoing rehabilitation therapy, um, remote patient monitoring can be very useful there as well. Next slide. Next slide, please. Perfect. Oh. Hmm. I wonder why the... Oh, good. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so, so this was the first code um, that came out that was a standalone reimbursement for remote patient monitoring. It came out in 2018. This, um, some of you may or may not have really heard of this one. This was sort of the, the precursor to what what's mainly happening today. But it is, um, it is for the collection and interpretation of data that's digitally stored or transmitted uh, by a patient or caregiver to a physician or other qualified healthcare provider. Um, and it's for an aggregation of 30 minutes of time during uh, 30 days, a 30 day period. And you know, the tricky part about that potentially um, is, th is that you know, it requires the physician or the qualified healthcare provider to really be doing the monitoring uh, and um, analysis of the data. Um, and it requires, you know, who, whichever one of those individuals is to be able to bill for it. Um, now, it's possible that, you know, a qualified healthcare provider could bill incident to a physician services on this front. Um, and, and you all may have some thoughts and some other creative ways to use this code. But, but you know, uh, that was, again, sort of the first example of an RPM code that came out in a standalone reimbursement. And a lot of physicians and uh, qualified healthcare providers, you know, said in response to this, we don't really want to spend 30 minutes of time a month um, on sort of monitoring a dashboard and looking at data and figuring out what's going on with these different patients. We want some, um, some other folks to be able to monitor that data and be able to escalate problems to us. So in light of that feedback, we had sort of the next um, phase of remote patient monitoring codes that came up. Next, next slide, please. Okay, and let's actually shoot all of these on here. I didn't realize I had these firing in. Okay, so in 2019, um, the first, these first three codes went into effect, and it was really, as I said, in response to feedback that physicians didn't want to be themselves spending that aggregate amount of time looking at patient health data. And that in addition, there was other time and effort required um, to set up and, and um, make sure people are equipped for remote patient monitoring. And so um, CMS established code 99453, which is a one-time code for the first time um, uh, a patient undergoes uh, a particular remote patient monitoring episode. And it is for initial setup and patient education about um, around the remote patient monitoring device or devices and or the technology platform. The second two codes are monthly, are potentially monthly recurring codes, um, meaning you know they are billable by the month for however long the patient is on a remote patient monitoring protocol. So CPC code 99454 is for supply of the device or devices that are used with um, that are used to monitor the patient. And that device, you know, those, those types of devices can vary, you know, quite broadly. Um, we, we currently represent about over 60 remote patient monitoring companies um, in my law practice. And there are all types of devices being used for all types of um, monitoring for all types of conditions. Um, you know, the classic examples are for various vital signs that are relevant to particular conditions. And certainly that is one way um, in which remote patient monitoring will now be envisioned um, as, used, as used to sort of identify and manage COVID-19. But, um, but it is also the case that, you know, I have, um, there are some really interesting devices out there that um, are being used with certain types of therapy. Um, and I can talk about those use cases um, in a little bit, but, but 99454 is for supply of a device or multiple devices that are being used as part of the therapy and that are transmitting um, the physiologic data, you know, through a platform. So, Carrie, um, just right here, I wanted to, so for this audience, I think a big part of where 
what they would be using or, or keeping track of are home home exercise programs. So things mm -hmm. that they've given patients to do just to give people something that, that's relevant to them to sort of latch onto. So like, you know, homework that you've given your patient to do, whether it's exercises, activities, surveys, diaries, and then the patient generated health data that's coming back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Is that so, so happen? yeah, so, so, you know, I'll caveat this as well, right? It is my understanding, actually, and I have a call at 2.30 that I hope will reveal a little more. It is my understanding that um, CMS is actually going to put out additional guidance around remote patient monitoring um, that's going to explain a little bit more, right, and, and broaden remote patient monitoring a little bit more. When these codes were passed, they were um, passed with or they were implemented with pretty broad strokes. They they were um, they were not very specific about whether um, you know what types of devices could be used. They weren't very specific about you know whether a mobile medical app could be used. They weren't very specific about whether um, you know what happens if a patient um, self reports um, enters information into an app that's then remotely transmitted you know to a healthcare provider does that count as remote patient monitoring or does it have to be you know a connected device uh, you know like a knee brace or something like that that is remotely transmitting the data CMS has not previously answered any of those questions they'd said they were going to put guidance out in um, the 2019 rule and they did not um, it is my understanding that um, because people really see value in using these codes in particular around COVID, um, that CMS is, has, you know, is, is going to actually put forward some guidance that should re release the constraints um, on remote patient monitoring, fingers and toes crossed, um, in a way that, that allows them um, to be used sort of in as broad a capacity as possible. So, John, you know, to answer your question, there is a lot of gray area in 99454 um, about sort of, you know, how all of that works. Um, I think that right now, certainly in this time, you know, CMS is, is uh, interpreting things pretty broadly. My advice to my clients is always, you know, to make a reasonable interpretation based on what we know thus far and what we've been given by CMS. So, um, you know, you and I discussed yesterday too that this this additional guidance might be forthcoming. So there may be other things to share with you, you know, uh, soon. Um, okay. But but for now, this is kind of the parameters that we have. Um, so nine nine four five seven is so. Well, back to nine nine four five four. It's really mm -hmm. actually. Can you go back for a second? Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. So nine nine four five seven is really for the time um, that a physician, a qualified healthcare provider and or clinical staff spends um, aggregating 20 minutes during a calendar month monitoring and analyzing patient data, right? And interacting live with the patient and making treatment changes as necessary. So for example, in, in the rehabilitation context, um, it is absolutely the case that a physical therapist or an occupational therapist or a respiratory therapist or, you know, or a speech therapist could, could look at a dashboard, a remote patient monitoring dashboard of panel of patients and see who's doing what and you know see who has sort of a red yellow versus green flag right the green flag people are probably uh chugging along okay based on the data that's being transmitted the yellow flag folks you know maybe having some difficulty maybe they're not meeting their um you know maybe they're not quite meeting their um um goals with with respect to their therapy exercises and the red ones might be you know doing no activity at all so you know it is absolutely the case that um therapists could be taking a look at that data picking up the phone calling the yellow flag people calling the red flag people say hey what's going on and aggregate all of that time um you know towards time spent um in remotely monitoring the patient so um and then this year in 2020 99458 came out which is which is reimbursement for an additional 20 minutes. So 99457 was for the initial 20 minutes. 99458 is if um, if you spend up to you know an, another 20 minutes, up to 40 minutes, or even up to 60 minutes during the course of a month um, in interacting with a particular patient. Carrie, I think that so I you know it's funny when 99458 came out. It was nice, but it was we didn't you know I we didn't see a lot of folks doing more than the additional 20 minutes um but i think that you know given everything that's coming on i i think it'll be even more relevant is that yeah. so i want to and i didn't know the answer to this 
is can 99458 is that a one time in the 30 days or if you are spending so you spend 20 minutes week one and you're doing 457 you spend another 20 minutes on that patient 458 excuse me in week two and then you have another you know you're rounding on that patient again in week three is can you do like you know is there a limited number of four or five dates that you can do in a 30 day period or is it for yeah, just so, every 20 minutes so that's a good question there is not a 100 percent clear answer on that in the proposed rule it seemed like cms was saying subsequent 20 minutes um intervals which which potentially meant more than one um in the final rule um i don't i think it took out the so, you know, it's a, maybe it took out making, making it plural, whatever. It, it made it so that there's a little bit of lack of clarity as to whether they meant it only can be done. It only can be done for one more increment of 20 minutes, or whether it, you know, you could do 60. You could do beyond that. Um, it's okay. it's not clear. So we'll see if we get additional guidance on that front. Okay. I just I can see four, five, eight really coming into play if we're doing a lot more remote management and less in uh, in clinic. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. Especially if you're, um, you know, if you're, if if the telehealth um, doesn't open up as much as we'd like to, and you're really having to substitute RPM for, you know, in-office visits, then, um, then yeah, I can certainly see that as well. Yeah, or you're using them, or hopefully you're using them, uh, you know, as as in combination, right? So you're, right. you know, it's like, okay, well, we'll do one remote visit this week, and then we'll be monitoring you the rest of the week remotely, and you know, I mean. 20 minutes doesn't it doesn't take very long to rack up 20 minutes on a patient looking yeah. at the data coming back. So okay, all right, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and I see a question in the box about whether all these codes need to be built incident to, and we'll, we will get to that. So let's turn, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so yeah, so this is relevant, right? So um, the the clinical staff member um, is, you know, they say qualified healthcare professional professional or clinical staff. I think there's no question but that therapists would um, fall more into the bucket of um, qualified healthcare professionals, certainly, than just clinical staff. But the point is, is that remote patient monitoring has to be ordered and billed by either a physician or a nurse practitioner or a PA. So um, in, that, in that sense, then yes, it is the case that um, billing of the RPM codes would have to happen incident to a physician's ordering and billing of, uh, and, you know, of, of the uh, remote patient monitoring services. Um, okay, so, you know, the key thing with clinical staff is whether it's making sure that whoever is doing the monitoring, whether it's clinical staff or a QHCP, is acting within um, their scope of practice in the law and the state in which they're practicing under. Again, you know, that's loosening a bit in, during this time as well, but um, it's something to keep in mind as a general matter. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, incident to billing up until January of this year um, had to be under direct supervision, which meant that the billing practitioner um, had to be in the same physical location as whoever it was that was monitoring the data, the clinical staff or the QHCP. Um, you know, we provided a lot of feedback to CMS that, that was not useful for as a business model. Um, and so CMS, as of January 1 this year, allowed incident two billing to happen under um, uh, general supervision. So in that case, if a doctor you know, is ordering remote patient monitoring um, and, and billing for it, you know, neither the qualified healthcare professionals nor the clinical staff need to be located in the same physical location as the billing practitioner in order to um, engage in remote patient monitoring services. And of course, that is very, very relevant for the time we find ourselves in right now. Next slide. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so this is, this is, these are the sort of current requirements for RPM um, as we know them. Um, as I mentioned again, you know, I am hearing ch chatter that we will be getting some additional guidance that could change some of these things um, sooner rather than later. Um, I don't think it will change that it has to be ordered by a physician or QHCP. Um, um, 
And then the initiating visit, the initiating face-to-face -face visit, I think we would would probably see that change, right? I think that that it's very, very likely that a face-to-face, -face, an initiating face-to-face -face visit for a patient who hasn't been seen within the last year um, could be virtual rather than like literally in person. Um, uh, the the uh, we should always make sure that we're documenting patient consent in the medical record. Um, we usually provide our um, remote patient monitoring vendors some you know patient consent forms that um, that are very clear and that are easy to to sort of incorporate into the medical record. Um, the device used for remote patient monitoring um, has to meet the FDA definition of a medical device. This does not mean that it has to um, um, be cleared or approved as a medical device. It has to meet the definition of a medical device. Um, and so that is, that's a pretty broad um, sweep. Um, you do have to keep in mind though, that if there's no peripheral device, like a, you know, a, a wirelessly transmitting knee brace or some other component that's transmitting um, motion or, or, or data on that front, um, you have to, if there's no sort of device that's, that's peripheral that's transmitting that data, you would want to be sure that the platform that, that the patient is using, the, um, you know, the app, for example, that they're using on their end, if they were to enter in their own medical data, would be considered a mobile medical device. Um, and that's sort of a complicated nuance that we can, I can discuss offline with, with anyone who needs that. Um, there's got to be some interactive communication with the patient, um, and, you know, at least one live interactive communication. Um, and that could be, you know, that that could could be by phone, it could be virtually, you know, uh, video, whatever. Um, but you do need to have during the course of that month some live interaction. Um, and then uh, the remote patient monitoring has to be ordered, you know, for longer than 16 days, right? And, and they want this to be a longer term um, tool um, for monitoring as opposed to sort of shorter term diagnostic monitoring. That's kind of the distinction there. And then um, it, it's interesting to note that, that these RPM codes can be billed in relation and conjunction with chronic care management codes, transitional care management codes, behavioral health integration codes, et cetera, but um, you cannot double count the time. So if you're spending time on a phone, on the phone with a patient because you know they're um, you've looked at the their um, you've seen that they have a red flag on their RPM, you know, the platform that you're using because they, you know, haven't moved at all in two days um, and you're calling them up to see why. If that patient is also on chronic care management services, you can't count the time for that phone call for both chronic care management and for remote patient monitoring. It's just kind of um, logical, you know, extensions, no double dipping. Next slide. Um, let's actually... Um, bracket this. I, it's important, but I'm, I'm worried about our time. Um, there are some other virtual um, or technology-based communication codes that are currently in the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. Um, PIX, PIX code uh, 2012 for virtual check-ins is when is usually used in the context of um, a patient calling the office and saying, hey, I'm having a problem. Do I need to come in and see you? Um, and, you know, if indeed uh, a, a uh, practitioner gets on the phone with that patient and determines that they don't need to come in within the next 24 hours and they haven't come in within the prior seven days, then you can bill $15 for that, for that time. Um, same with uh, a pre-recorded uh, video or still image. Um, a patient can send you one of those and, and um, have it evaluated and, and have make a determination as to whether or not that patient needs to come in for an in-office visit. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, now this is the one that um, I, like John told me you all um, have been talking quite a bit about, and this is the e-visits. Just to give you some context, um, these e-visit codes work kind of uh, slapped into this 2020 Medicare physician fee schedule without a lot of explanation. Um, they were in the proposed rule. Um, they, the description was of, of, of an e-visit and what it was intended to be used for was um, 
really very, very brief. In fact, there was there was no real description of the sort of intended use cases. Um, on we submitted on behalf of a number of our clients requests to sort of clarify like what these e-visits should be used for. Um, and CMS was, well, you know, well, they, they they ran short on time in, in meeting their deadline to finalize the rule, and they did not um, address any of those requests for clarification and simply just put them in as final um, as they had been in the proposed rule. So we're operating in a little bit of a vacuum um, with respect to the e-visit code. So again, my fallback is always, let's make a reasonable interpretation based on what we do know. Um, we know that you, know, you all are not necessarily um, limited from from billing these codes we know that um, there are three codes that are that are only for physicians to bill and those are the um, cpt codes that start in the nine nines that are listed there on the bottom and then we know that there are three hicks picks codes that can be billed by non-physician healthcare professionals um, says who cannot independently bill these services so um, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't know whether that's incident two or whether that's sort of in the hospital context. I'm, I'm sure it could be, um, but it is for they call them online digital evaluation and management services. Um, the patient is supposed to be a pre-existing established patient. Again, that's something that we could see changed um, given the situation that we're in. Um, the this 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 digital evaluation and management service takes place over the course of seven days and uh, it can, the increments of time that are reimbursable are between five and 10 minutes, 11 20 to 20 minutes, and then 21 or more minutes. So if during the course of a day, a therapist, or the course of seven days, a therapist spends, you know, five to 10 minutes uh, on the phone or, actually I don't believe that these can be, you know, on the phone or sort of via a patient portal, Nothing was mentioned about a patient portal in the Medicare physician fee schedule, but the CPT manual mentions the patient portal. So, you know, I guess it's the case that if, if indeed the therapist were to spend five to 10 minutes communicating with a patient of theirs via a patient portal over the course of seven days, uh, they could bill, you know, Hicks Picks code uh, G262, G2062. Um, so there we have it. I am hopeful that. Um, you know, we will get some additional information about these codes. Um, it is, you know, it is certainly the case that perhaps one of your uh, patients who's undergoing rehabilitation therapy, you know, might um, be having a difficult time with a particular exercise. Um, one thing that I think I did not include on here, and I hope maybe I have it on the next slide or maybe I don't, but it is, they are, so these need to be patient initiated, right? So, so, so you can't, as a practitioner, be proactively reaching out to the patient to have one of these e-visits, that the patient has to request an e-visit, they have to initiate it. So then it's like, well, how, how on earth is a patient, patient gonna know they can request an e-visit? You are allowed to educate the patient about the availability of these e-visits, um, but you can't you know, take the step of initiating them yourselves. They have to be patient initiated. So if you had, uh, you know, one of your patients who was undergoing therapy, you could say to them, hey, listen, I know we're not going to be able to see each other in the office um, for the next while. Um, you can initiate an online consult with me, an online visit with me through our patient portal, and I can help you with any questions you have. So, you know, here's your patient portal. Here's how to log into it. Um, if you need to contact me, contact me this way, and we can communicate this way. Um, and that is billable time. So next slide. Okay, this uh, you all will probably be interested in the reimbursement rates for some of the things that we've just discussed for 2020. Um, those that are listed as non-facility reimbursement rates are for, for you know basically standalone practices, and the facility reimbursement rates are you know sites like uh, hospital-based um, uh, or uh, SNF-based. So um, you can see that the, the two columns of reimbursement amounts there for the various codes. Um, in terms of sort of, I guess, bang for the buck, right? Um, it is the case that the remote patient monitoring 
codes, um, you know, have the higher reimbursements of, of the, the other ones that are listed. But, uh, you know, in the spirit of some reimbursement is better than no reimbursement, um, we should absolutely be figuring out sort of how to um, utilize all of these in combination. Next slide. Okay, so that's it. Um, so, uh, John, you want to do questions? Would you be able to pop that slide back up just so you could see again that last one? Just the next one, just because I want to bring this to my agency and I want to say, um, you know, just to have the contact or your I info. I, was, I just realized I was muted. Carrie, I just wanted to say thank you very much for um putting this together was extremely informative i think this is exactly the information that our members are looking for um so yeah let's go back up through the list so um we are going to be taking we have just a few minutes left for questions um so if anybody has any questions please post those into the chat um i'm just going to go back through um someone was asking about medicare versus medicaid um i think we covered that in one of the slides you know medicaid at least you know and correct me if i'm wrong carrie they're usually catching up and it's more of a state by state um, sometimes so, they're ahead it, can, it really varies like texas is extremely ahead in in terms of medicaid reimbursement for remote patient monitoring um so it, it varies they each state's doing their own thing okay hey john um, the person right before you had asked if you could keep it on the next slide because she wanted to send contact information along oh right here we go thanks okay uh let's see a lot of people asking if we're going to post these yes we are going to post these uh let's see um why did it go wait i don't know why that moved okay um for home care therapists would we only be able to use hixpix codes right now is that correct i believe that's correct yes that's that's what it sounds like for now Okay, and the data service for the remote patient monitoring charge during the 30-day period. What should the data service be for the remote patient charge during the 30-day uh, period? Yeah, it's a little it's a little weird. Um, you can do it well. The CMS did not um, think through this very carefully in the way they structured sort of the the requirements for so for 99453 and 99454, it's supposed to be by the calendar month. And for 99457, it's supposed to be 30 days. Um, and so, you know, in theory, you could bill for 99457 at the time at which you hit the uh, minute requirement. Um, and then I'd probably wait to bill 99453 and 99454 until the end, you know, the end of a month or, or the beginning of a month for the, the prior month. Well, that's the bill date. So he was asking about the date of service, but my understanding is that the date of service is a range. It's not. It's not tied to an encounter. Oh, yeah, right. So it's, it's, it's a time-based person. charge. Yeah. So yeah. you're just accumulating minutes over time. It's not. You have your bill date, but it's not. There isn't really a date of service because it's. It's not. It, it's not episodic. It's not tied to a single episode. It's stretching over a period of time. I hope that helps. Uh, bill date, yeah. So it's within a 30-day period. And remember um, that not to bill uh, RPM on the same day as other E&M codes. Um, someone asked, to my knowledge, patient portal is no longer required for 2061, et cetera. Um, that's correct. Yeah, it's it it was. I, is that right, Carrie? It was designed for that in mind, but it it you don't necessarily have to use a patient portal for that. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean it wasn't. I mean that wasn't even in the Medicare physician fee schedule. You know, it is. It is mentioned. Um, I think in the um, latest guidance that CMS put out, when they mentioned these e-visits, they do mention a patient portal. But you know, they're I, they're not necessary. I, you know, I don't. It it seems strange to me that it's it would not have a requirement. It's not a requirement. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do, nur do nurse practitioners fall under 99421 or G2061? Uh, um, can you go back up to that slide for me and I'll go two yeah. slides back and I'll, I think it's. Two slides back? Yeah. 
here? Yes. Practitioners who can independently bill e &M. So yeah, nurse practitioners and PAs would be under the 9-9 um, CPT codes rather than the HICS-PICS codes. Got it, okay. Um, for home care therapists, we would only be able to use HICS-PICS codes right now, is that right? No, well, let me actually clarify because we we did that we hit that question earlier. But when you say home care therapist, I you, I assume you're meaning you're going to their home. Yeah, home health. So, so, so uh, just a little background. The Department of Health has told us that as home care therapists, we now can only see patients that are deemed critical. So that leaves a large pool of patients that we currently have, and we're still getting orders for patients who might not be critical, but we still want to be monitoring them. So we're doing phone visits right now, but we're wondering about trying to get reimbursed for all these other patients that we're not actually going into the home per the Department of Health. Yeah, I would have whomever is ordering home therapy, home care therapy, to order remote patient monitoring. And then that would allow us to use those other codes? Correct. Okay. So if we have MD order remote patient monitoring, that'll cover us. Should be. Okay. I, I guess I was understanding it differently that they had to be billing for it as well, and then we could bill under them. But as long as they order it that way, so, we can use those other codes, the well, nine, so, nine, nine codes. So, so are you, so basically a, um, an MD or another billing practitioner has to bill the codes. So yeah, see that doesn't happen. They order home uh -huh. care to go in, and then we're just on our own with all the billing. They're just giving us an order to go in. Well, then this may be a better situation. Well, yeah. So so there's a couple ways you could do it, right? I mean, what a lot of um, what a lot of people are doing is providing like outsourced monitoring. Uh, that goes along with remote patient monitoring, you know, platforms. So you could enter into an arrangement whereby, you know, a group of home therapists would be considered sort of the monitoring aspect, the monitoring component of remote patient monitoring services for the patients you're treating. And the physicians would bill all of it, all of the remote patient monitoring codes to you, but pay you a services fee for the monitoring that you are actually doing. So you wouldn't be billing yourselves, but you could get it. You could create an arrangement whereby you could get a services fee. Like, I mean, that's one way of doing it. Um, you know, again, it's not sort of like the most straightforward thing, but but that is one way to do it. Okay, so it's a little tricky because we have like you know a hundred different doctors ordering, so it's yeah, yeah, understood. It might even be easier just to go with the HCS PCS. Well, and again, now. You know, again, if they open up, you know, telehealth, you could do right. some, some of this that way, right? That would be the best thing for you, I think. Right. And, and are we going to be discussing this further on more calls, whether they're opening telehealth? Uh, we are. Yeah. So we've right. got, um, so tomorrow we have ASHA coming in. And then on Tuesday, we have APTA. And then on Thursday, we have the AOTA. So each of them are going to be sort of speaking for their individual, you know, the nuances, things that are coming out today um, that, uh, you know, might be affecting this. And so and to, to, to be clear, Carrie, I didn't, so you're saying that in, in a, say in a hospital environment, if you have physicians who are not employed, they're independent, the, the PTs and OTs can still drop the RPM codes. They're incident too, but they're doing they're they're charging through the facility fee through the facility. Is that isn't that correct or no? Am I misunderstanding that? You don't have to have a physician that's dropping RPM codes in order to charge RPM codes. Well, if I mean they're qualified healthcare pros, listen, if the MACs are paying for it, great, do it, right? Like that's that I mean, it is it is a hundred percent unclear from the way that CMS has laid it out. But if in the hospital setting a doctor is ordering remote patient monitoring and therapists are, you know, billing for the codes and those codes are being paid, those claims are being paid, that's great. Um, you know, CMS has said that either, you know, MDs or qualified healthcare professionals have, have to, you know, be billing. Um, 
but you know if, if they're being i mean they are qhcps and if they're billing sort of via the hospital then potentially that's fine i mean what you're going to find is that max are going to be pretty confused about all of this stuff and they have been you know from the outset and you know we're only at march in a time where um general supervision for remote patient monitoring has only like just now come into effect so they're only beginning to process these codes and there's a lot of confusion so you know the other thing that it would be good to ask cms for um, on the remote patient monitoring front for therapists is clarification on that point right um mm -hmm. can can a you know can can someone like a therapist, a qualified healthcare provider like a therapist working in a hospital-based setting, bill you know those like you know those other components of RPM? Yeah. Okay. Um, another question, Carrie. Thank you for that. Uh, to be clear, the codes we could use if we were a QHP, uh, which we are not. If we are a therapy discipline, these are codes we could use. If oh. Um, that was during the presentation. If someone wants to clarify that, um, because I think it was asked on a specific slide. Um, do, 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 do. I am not quite getting the gist of the question. Yeah, how does remote patient monitoring compare to CMS covered e-visits? I think we covered that. What about the codes uh, G2061, 6263? Did the seven day period vanish? No, seven day period is, is, is relevant to the e-visits with those HixPix codes. Okay, um, we will be posting these out. Um, can you please define a mobile medical device or direct us to a definition? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Uh -huh. Yeah, so yeah, um, short answer, FDA has, uh, is it's kind of a work in process with FDA. They have some guidance that they have posted as to what um, constitutes a mobile medical device. Um, I would recommend you take a look at that guidance. It is, there was There is old guidance that came out sort of 2015, 2016, and there's more recent guidance that came out in 2019, so be sure you're looking at the more recent guidance. Um, yeah, and we'll, they, we do have one from them that is, uh, the most recent one is, 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 is it's pretty clear. I mean, it's clear-ish, um, and we'll post that on there. It lists out, you know, what, it, there's a, because there's different classes of medical device. Yeah. Um, and so there, it's just sort of a range, but it's it's a it's a good guide to just sort of like rule of thumb of what constitutes a medical device. Yeah, um, it's sort of around diagnosis and treatment, right, of a of a patient, um, rather than preventive. Like preventive is not a medical device, which is tricky, um, and diagnosis and treatment is. Yeah. Um, so where is all this going to be posted? There's a, um, a pandemic task force web page on the ACRM site. Um, I think there's a scrolling banner on the front page for the pandemic task force. So just wait for it to come around in the cycle. Um, it'll take you to the page where um, all of this information will be posted and um, we'll, we'll get those other things in there, like links of who to call, what's a medical device, these slides. Um, I also should have put John on there that we, my, I have a COVID-19 page. It's a resource page for telehealth and remote patient monitoring on my website. Um, why don't I type it in the bar here, and then you guys can. Yeah, and we'll we'll um, carry. We'll post that um, link out also on the page, so um, so that people can get to Nixon Law Group. I know you guys are uh, that are updating your page with stuff every day, yep. um, as things are coming out of the hill. So um, it's a, it is a really up to date resource if you're um, if you're looking for new thing, you know, sort of interpretations of you know like the bill that was passed this morning. And you know that that's going to take a little while to digest, I think. But so it will be a good, you know, it's a good resource to just come back to. Um, I, I actually don't have anything up there about the bill yet because I was sort of sticking it in this, trying to digest it all myself before this. But that will be up shortly. And I just posted the link in the in the box there. Great, great. Okay, well, I, I think that's it for today, Carrie. Again, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, very, very informative. I know, you know, there's a lot of questions and a lot of things we don't know, but it was, there was a lot in here that at least we do know, you know, I thought you did a really good job of outlining what we do know, and hopefully there's enough here for, for us to, uh, to jump on and, and start participating in, you know, kind of. Uh, you know,
making it making sure that we don't waste an opportunity to um, expand services that we can uh, provide to patients and get paid for. So thank you everybody. Tune in tomorrow, same same time. Uh, we'll be having uh, Neela Swanson from uh, ASHA talking about uh, really the sort of speech all of these legislation changes, coding, coding questions relative to speech therapists, although we, we welcome all, uh, we welcome everybody. Um, and then, uh, like I said, we'll be back in on Tuesday and Thursday and Friday of next week. So uh, have a good afternoon and uh, we'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Thank thanks you so much. much. This was awesome. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Carrie. All right. Bye-bye.